welcome to Read Red. Today I'm talking about a non-fiction collection by Jorge Luis Borges. This is the Total Library, above a collection of non-fictions from 1922 to 1986. And if you've seen my videos, you'll know that I am a big fan of Borges. Uh, I read fictions uh, pretty much around this time last year, and you know, uh, of course, mind blow, etc., etc. Um, if I was to summarize this book, this essay collection, in just uh, one sentence, I would say that if Borges's collected fictions are better than food, then his essay collection is better than sex, because I would just fawn over these pages, every single essay I would jump to, and I would just be like, oh my god, oh my god, uh, thinking about the topics that he's exploring. Um, if I can, I'll just read uh, some kind of, at random, some... Uh, titles of, of essays from the table of contents. So in some of his early writings, he explores topics such as the nothingness of personality, the history, a history of angels, a profession of literary faith, and an investigation of the word, which is not uh, the capital word like, uh, uh, like God, um, but uh, actually studying uh, sentences in, in uh, in depth, he uh, takes the first line from the Quixote and just uh, looks at every single part of the sentence, and it's really interesting. Um, later on, from the years uh, 1929 to 1936, he talks about the perpetual race of Achilles and the tortoise, which, again, talking about infinity, which is going to become really big themes in Borges's writing, it's, it was quite incredible, actually, to see him writing sort of preliminary essays, working up to things that would eventually become uh, works of his. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second, but some other just great titles. The Duration of Hell, The Superstitious Ethics of a Reader, The Postulation of Reality, The Homeric Versions, where he talks about translations uh, and different approaches to translating. He um, uh, provides like seven, six or seven different examples of the same section from the Odyssey as translated by different people. Narrative Art and Magic, The Art of Verbal Abuse, and the doctrine, A Doctrine of Cycles, sorry, The Doctrine of Cycles and A History of Eternity. He does some movie reviews, which in fairness, I actually, I read some of them, but I skipped some of them because he actually, he talks about some uh, reviews that, uh, of films that I want to see. So like films like Citizen Kane that I've actually not watched yet. And he talked about, and he said he, he called it an exceptional film, which is sort of all I know before I moved on. And he's got a couple of introductions, prologues to books, which again, he talks, he has a prologue for Leaves of Grass, which I haven't yet read. So I skipped some stuff in the book, uh, if I thought it would be kind of spoilers. Uh, but of course it's a nonfiction book. I'm always coming back to it and I'm taking notes of, uh, great stuff. So he has some book reviews. He reviews uh, Absalom. Absalom. Uh, he talks about the tale of Genji and uh, just a bunch of other stuff. He actually talks briefly about Joyce. Uh, well, actually, he talks a lot about James Joyce, and he really loves James Joyce, uh, especially Ulysses, which is just this labyrinthine um, masterpiece as far as Borges is concerned. But it's actually interesting reading the essays as they go along um, from between the years... Uh, when he talks about Finnegan's Wake, which he even uh, knew about it being at first titled Work in Progress, and he, um, similar to Vladimir Nabokov, Borges actually didn't like it. He just thought it was kind of um, really bad puns <laughs> throughout the whole thing, uh, which was kind of funny. But he, early on, he talks about Ulysses, and, and uh, Ulysses was just an incredible experience for Borges. And uh, skipping forward, uh, just sticking with the table of contents for now, uh, he has he wrote a series of essays between 1937 and 1945 during uh, basically notes on Germany and the war, uh, and he was very opposed to uh, Adolf Hitler and the nationalism that was happening in Germany and some of the nationalism that ended up creeping into uh, Argentina. Um, but some of these essays were called A Pedagogy of Hatred, An Essay on Neutrality, a Definition of a German Germanophile, uh, and uh, then commenting on specific years like 41 and uh, 1944. He has a section called A Fragment on Joyce, which is so incredible because if you've read uh, Funes, His Memory, in this, uh, let me actually skip to it and find it because... Um, it, it was one of those examples that I was talking about of uh, Borges talking about something that he eventually goes on to write. So, A Fragment on Joyce, this essay was written in 1941, and I believe Funes' memory was written in 1942, the year after. 
But Borges starts this by saying, Among the works I have not written and will not write, but which in some way, however mysterious and rudimentary, justify me, is a story eight or ten pages long whose profuse first draft is titled Funes the Memorius, and which in another, more chastened versions, is called Ireneo Funes. The protagonist of this doubly chimerical fiction is a typically wretched uh, compadrito living in Frebentos or Union around 1884. Uh, The mother irons clothes, etc., etc., skipping forward. In childhood, he was self from school. Uh, he's incredibly idle. He spends virtually his entire life on a cot, his eyes fixed on a fig tree in the backyard or on a spider web. His perceptions and memory were infallible. We, at first glance, perceived three glasses on a table, Funes, every leaf, and grape on a vine. He knew the shapes of the southernmost clouds in the sunrise of, of April 30th, 1884, and he could compare them in his memory to the veins in the stiff marbled binding of a book he once held in his hands during the childhood. He could reconstruct every dream, every reverie. Uh, he died of pneumonia and his incommunicable life was the richest in the universe, which is exactly... Well, it's not exactly. It's some some variations, but uh, Borges went on to write Funes, the, uh, his memory, or Funes the Memorius. But it was so incredible that in this essay, a fragment on Joyce, he compares James Joyce's and... Uh, or James Joyce to Funes because of the amount of detail that... Uh, was in Ulysses. It's just just incredible, incredible, uh, hyper detailed picture. Um, and so it was kind of cool for for uh, Borges to be like, yeah, man, Joyce is Joyce is got just this incredible memory, and he's almost this kind of paragon or archetype of memory. Um, but that kind of leads a little bit into another thing that I really liked about this collection was just how much Borges loves loves books. Like, yeah, we all know of Borges's. Um, quotes and and sayings. Uh, I've always imagined heaven being something like a library. Uh, People talk about life as being it, but I've always preferred reading and things like that. But just reading his essays and seeing how much he loves literature is so, is so awesome. Um, Skipping back to the table of contents, he he has essays on circular time, on uh, literary description. He talks about dreams. I would say that maybe one of the big highlights, or the two big highlights, are the essays between the years 1945 and 1955, which include his Dante-esque essays. So he talks about the false problem of uh, uh, Ugolino, the last voyage of Ulysses, the pitying torturer, Dante and the Anglo-Saxon visionaries, uh, the Simurgh and the Eagle, uh, the meeting in a dream, Beatrice's last smile. All of these essays, uh, uh, Borges is commenting on and talking about the Divine Commedia from Dante. And then I'll just read off a couple more. In, this is his 1946 to 1955 essays. Our Poor Individualism on Oscar Wilde, A New Refutation of Time, which has the greatest ending to an essay. Oh, I think it actually ended up becoming a poem, but I'll come back to that. From allegories to novels, from someone to no one, the wall and the books, where he talks about uh, the first Chinese emperor, uh, the personality, personality and the Buddha, Pascal's sphere, on the cult of books, Kafka and his precursors, uh, forms of a legend, the dialogues of ascetic and king, Flaubert and his exemplary destiny, and a history of the tango. It goes on the books. There are still even more great things, but those are the really, really big ones. Um, uh, later on, because he got uh, more into lecturing, there are, you will find some lectures in this uh, series as well. He talks about being an Argentine uh, writer and about how what you create will contribute to your legacy as uh, your nation, your nation's legacy, kind of whether you like it or not. And he makes this great uh, uh, kind of comparison or contrast to determinism where he says 
if I said that I was going to reach and touch something with my left hand, the determinists would say I was always going to reach and touch something with my left hand. If I said I was going to touch something with my left hand and then touch it with my right hand instead, the determinists would say that, no, you were actually always determined to touch it with your uh, right hand. And Borges says that, that that's the same about your legacy. Regardless, whatever you do, um, if it's influential enough, it will be seen as a uh, Argentine uh, work. It will be seen as an Australian work or an American work or whatever. Anyway, uh, from here, I'm going to skip through and just find some specific fragments, some things that I highlighted, some, uh, obviously I'm not reading full essays, but just uh, little little things that I've kind of noted or, t or taken down. In A History of Angels, Borges writes, Theologians, admirable in their intellectualism, do not shrink from angels and did not shrink from angels and tried to penetrate this world of wings and mirages with their reasoning minds. There was This was no uncomplicated matter, for angels had to be defined as being superior to man, but necessarily inferior to divinity. The German speculative theologian Rother records numerous examples of the push and pull of this dialectic. He, his list of angelic attributes uh, merits consideration. Those attributes include intellectual force, free will, immateriality, capable, however, of accidentally uniting itself with matter, a spatiality, neither t taking up space nor being enclosed in it, lasting duration with a beginning but without an end, invisibility and even immutability, and an attribute that harbors them in the eternal. As for the faculties they exercise, they are granted the utmost suppleness, the power of conversing among themselves instantaneously without words or signs, and that of working wonders, but not miracles. They cannot create from nothing or raise the dead. The angelic zone that lies halfway between God and man is, it would seem, highly regulated. If by any chance you've ever come across the saying, everything so things that rhyme are more likely to be true. Uh, this is, you might kind of have some uh, recalcitrance to that. And so does Borges, because he's, this is in an essay, A Profession of Literary Faith. Some lines earlier, I insisted upon the urgency of the subjective or objective truth that images require. Now I will establish that rhyme, brashly artificial, can infuse the most truthful compositions with a false aura and that, in general, its effect is counterpoetic. All poetry is a confession and the premises uh, and the premises of any confession are one's confidence in the listener and the candor of the speaker. Rhyme's original sin is its air of deceit. Although this deceit is only an annoyance, never plainly exposed, the mere suspicion of it serves to discourage full-blown fervor. Some will say that frills are the foibles of feeble verse makers. I believe that this is an affliction of rhymed verse itself. Some hide it well and others poorly, but it is always there. The variety of words is another error. All the academicians recommend it, I think, mistakenly. I believe words must be conquered, lived, and that the apparent publicity they receive from the dictionary is a falsehood. Nobody should dare to write outskirts without having spent hours pacing their high sidewalks, without having desired and suffered as if they were a lover, without having felt their walls, their lots, their moons just around the corner from a general store like a cornucopia. I have now conquered my poverty, recognizing among thousands the nine or ten words that get along with my soul. I have already written more than one book in order to write perhaps one page. that The page that justifies me, that summarizes my destiny, the one that perhaps only the attending angels will hear when Judgment Day arrives. Simply, uh, the page that, at dusk, upon the resolved truth of day's end, at sunset, will it with its dark and fresh breeze and girls glowing against the street, I would dare to read to a friend. And oh my god, I just want to cuddle Borges. He's just... I love him so much, man. Oh, this is a great one. Okay, so... Uh, he is talking about the superstitious... This is the, the essay, The Superstitious Ethics of the Reader. And he is talking about perfection and uh, translation. So, for example... The vanity about style is an even more pathetic conceit. 
perfection. There is not a single poet who, as minor as he may be, hasn't sculpted the perfect sonnet, a minuscule moment that safeguards his possible immortality and which the novelties and effacements of time will be obligated to respect. It is usually a sonnet without curlicues, though the whole thing is a curlicue, that is, a shred of futility. This everlasting fallacy has been formulated and recommended by Flaubert in the following sentence. Correction in the highest sense of the word, does not th does to thinking what the waters of the Styx did with Achilles' body, that is, makes it invulnerable and indestructible. His judgment is conclusive, but I personally have not experienced any confirmation. I suppress the tonic virtues of the Styx, an infernal reference used for, uh, e for emphasis, not argument. The perfect page, the page in which no word can be altered without harm, is the most precarious of all. Changes in language erase shades of meaning, and the perfect page is precisely the one that consists of those delicate fringes that are so easily worn away. On the contrary, the page that becomes immortal can trend can traverse the fire of typographical errors, approximate translations, and inattentive or erroneous readings without losing its soul in the process. One cannot with impunity alter any line fabricated by Gungara, according to those who restore his texts, but Don Quixote wins posthumous battles against his translators and survives each and every careless version. Heine, who never heard it or read in Spanish, acclaimed it for eternity. The German, Scandinavian, or Hindu ghost of the Quixote is more alive than any stylist's anxious verbal artifices. And this uh, just contributes to a long-standing uh, theory or idea that I've had where, uh, you know, even later on in this book, Borges talks about Nabokov critici criticizing Dostoevsky, but Dostoevsky is another one of those ex uh, examples where the way that he writes is not particularly styled or fancy, but it penetrates and it is influential in every language uh, in which it is written and read. Another idea, uh, Borges commenting on perfection, to assume that every recombination of elements is necessarily inferior to its original form is to assume that draft 9 is necessarily inferior to draft H, for there can only be drafts. The concept of the definitive text corresponds only to religion or exhaustion. Oh, this is such an incredible uh, part. Uh, Bayathanatos is an essay where he's talking about... Um, uh, I believe John Donne, it's a, a treatise composed at the beginning of the 17th century, and uh, he talks about, um, but the thing that Borges is talking about, what I've sort of skipped to, is uh, the stated aim of uh, Beathanatos is to mitigate suicide, the fundamental aim to indicate that Christ committed suicide. And skipping forward, Christ died a voluntary death, Don suggests, and this means that the elements and the terrestrial orb and the generations of mankind and Egypt and Rome and Babylon and Judah were extracted from nothingness in order to destroy him. Perhaps iron was created for the nails and thorns for the mock crown and blood and water for the wound. This Baroque idea glimmers behind Biathanatos, the idea of a god who creates the universe in order to create his own gallows. Oh, wow, this was something I never would have thought that uh, Borges would have... Um, oh, I guess it's not really him. He is commenting on some different things, but he's really quickly talking about um, uh, the traditions, uh, people who traditionally didn't write anything down. So obviously, famously, there's Socrates and Pythagoras. But here are some quotes in the words of Clement of Alexandria, a man of pagan culture. The most prudent course is not to write, but to learn and teach by word of mouth, because what is written remains. And in the same treatise, to write all things in a book is to put a sword in the hands of a child. A writer or any man must believe that whatever happens to him is an instrument. Everything has been given for an end. This is even stronger in the case of the artist. Everything that happens, including humiliations, embarrassments, misfortunes, all have been given like clay, like material for one's art. One must accept it. And yeah, those are just some of my really favorite parts of the of the book that I highlighted every single Every single essay in this is just incredible, and he does start to repeat himself sometimes, I've noticed, but it is because he starts to get into... Um, uh, he explores different variations on the same ideas, so you will hear a lot of him talking about Schopenhauer uh, and uh, the world the world as will and representation. Uh, Borges gets very into... 
um, uh, realism versus idealism, which is explored in excellently in his book uh, Tlon Ukba, uh, Tertius Orb or Orbis. Uh, but yeah, that's all I want to say for now. I just want to say that this was such an incredible, incredible reading experience, and I love Borges so much. I need to hit the Trinity and maybe at some point in the in the future pick up some of his poetry. But please let me know if there's any essays of Borges that you particularly enjoyed, any that are in his, uh, any that I might have missed out. I don't know if they're consistent among this collection and like the big, uh, the, the bigger collection. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you get a chance to pick up Borges's uh, The Total Library, and I'll see you in the next video.